before you engage in certain forms of surgical intervention. What do you do? Once you detected this anal sphincter defect, if the defect is smaller than 180 degree, sphincter repair is an option. It's straightforward. Simply identify the lesion, excise the lesion, and readapt the musculature. This can be done in combination with elevatorplasty for additional stabilization of the ventral, uh, ventral part of the sphincter complex and the pelvic floor. How are the results? What can we expect? Multiple studies have been published, and the outcome varies between 6 and 90 percent, almost 90 percent. Why is that? It's related to the length of follow-up. So the message take home message is, it's a treatment which lasts for a certain time. The longer the follow-up, the poorer the outcome. And this is just one study which proved the fact that up to three to five years, there is an imp improvement of symptoms, but after that, the improvement is minor and, and the majority of patients are dealing with a pre-existing problem. What do we do if the, the sphincter lesion is larger than 180 percent? Or if there is a substantial loss of uh, perineal tissue? Just an example, you see half of the circumference of the anal sphincter is missing. This is mostly due to birth trauma. So sphincter repair itself is not an invaluable option to opt for. So you look, have to look for something to replace the sphincter. Re sphincter replacement options try to substitute really anatomy and by that, by that re-establishing function. Two modalities uh, around. Uh, they had greater popularity 10 years ago, but due to new developments, they are less frequently used, but they are still available. One option is to recre recreate the external anal sphincter by transposing a muscle from, from the leg and put it in a circumferential fashion around the anal sphincter. And this muscle itself is not designed to work as a continuous contracting sphincter muscle, so it needs to be powered by a uh, pacemaker, similar to a cardiac pacemaker device. How is the outcome? Variable depending on the indication, depending on the, the experience of the center. It is not an easy procedure. It's associated with some morbidity. But depending on the underlying condition, the outcome varies. In the problems associated with a loss of sensitivity or sensory dysfunction, like cauda lesions or cauda equina or after anal atresia, uh, outcome is less favorable. In opposite to that, trauma patients with no loss of sensation, no damage of the rectum, <coughs> may inspect a substantial improvement of symptoms with the dynamic raciloplasty. An alternative to dynamic raciloplasty is a so-called artificial sphincter. It's an adaptation of a treatment which uh, evolved in the field of urology. Different devices are around. I picked, picked this one. A uh, cuff is uh, placed around the anal sphincter and the uh, continuous pressure is maintained for more of the, all of the, most of the time, except for defecation there is a release of anal canal closing pressure. These are the results. High variation and similar to the dynamic raciloplasty, and this is mostly associated to the fact that it is a, prop, uh, a procedure which carries some inherent problem uh, resulting in uh, Substantial comorbidity, it's always a problem to place an artificial device in a body area which is naturally contaminated. So this selection has to be very particular in this specific patient. But these sphincter substitutes are last resort treatments. They can be considered as an alternative to the creation of a permanent sphincter, a uh, permanent uh, colostomy. And this needs to be discussed with the patient. So what do we do if we face patients with no sphincter defect but insufficient sphincter function? The concept of neurostimulation comes into play. This is a completely different concept. The concept is aiming to recruit residual function by peripheral nerve stimulation. Again, this is an adaptation of a technique which has been evolved in the field of urology. Patient is, is tested for the clinical benefit of a, temp uh, of a stimulation by a phase of a temporary stimulation for three two to three weeks, the clinical outcome while stimulating a nerve is tested. And once this is successful, which means an improvement of symptoms, uh, 
permanent implant is considered and discussed with the patient. The procedure itself is, minim is minimal invasive. In the past it involved an incision, nowadays it's done with the help of fluoroscopy. The procedure itself takes 30 minutes and an electrode is placed next to the target nerve. As you can see here, it should be in parallel to the target nerve and this electrode is powered with a device which can be switched on and off by the patient itself and it should be switched off for the act of defecation. What can we achieve? This is a, treat, uh, a, pa a patient example. Prior to treatment, 30% of the bowel emptyings were involuntary. With a test simulation, it came down to 8%. With teasing the test simulation, relapse of symptoms. And with the permanent stimulation with an implant, this specific patient became continent. One of the beauties of this technique is that the phase of test simulation is highly predictive of the outcome of a permanent implantation, which has two advantages. First thing, the patient knows what to expect. And those patients are really patients eager to undergo the operation of a permanent implant. Secondly, there's a high likelihood that you as a treating physician are successful if you recommend the permanent implant, which is not always the case in surgery. So how is the outcome? The outcome is rewarding. Multiple studies have been published. Various outcome parameters have been used, most commonly incontinence episodes per week or the so-called Wexen score. In any single study, there was a significant improvement of symptoms. Just to pick one specific study, one of the largest single center cohort studies to give you an idea in which etiologies of fecal incontinence is, is successful and how the successful, uh, success rate is. It works in fecal incontinence due to idiopathic causes, which means we don't know what's going on after sphincter rupture, after episiotomy, after sphincter repair, and the cohort of patients with presenting with neurological causes of fecal incontinence and the success of the testing ranges around 75%. The success of the testing is reproduced with a permanent implantation, with a permanent de device in this specific study and the effect of permanent stimulation is stable over the course of time. There's a five years follow-up. Not only the frequency of bowel content loss is decreased, also the ability to postpone defecation, which addresses the issue of urge, is addressed in a very positive way. This is one clinical feature of fecal incontinence. Patients, patients if continents are frequently forced to stay in the proximity of a restroom, and this problem is, o is over once the device is working and in place. A long-term outcome has been confirmed by multiple studies. It ranges around 80 to 85 percent. It's reproducible. One uh, of the studies who gave a major push to this, this technique and led to the approval by the FDA was published two years ago. It's an American study including 120 patients. It's, uh, it mimics the European experience pre-treatment condition, very severe, this is average fecal incontinence per week with permanent stimulation, a stable improvement of symptoms. Most of the patients did achieve an 80% improvement, some 100%, and this had a clear impact on quality of life. Coming back to the scale, depression, self-perception, lifestyle, embarrassment, coping and behavior in any single of these categories there was a significant improvement, and this accounts for the subcategories as well, if the treatment is working and the improvement is stable over the course of time. Five-year follow-up data are expected in, in due course. Sacral nerve stimulation is done for patients, is recommended for patients presenting with no sphincter defect. But how about those patients presenting with a small sphincter defect, let's say, based on the not too positive experience with the direct conventional sphincter repair, sacral nerve stimulation was used for those patients as well. Here an example, patients presenting with no gap of the sphincter with a lesion less than 90 degrees and a lesion between 90 and 108, uh, 120 degrees. The outcome is comparable without the sphincter defect being repaired. And this finding is reproduced now by uh, um, not only one study but multiple studies. And they treated, they use sacral nerve stimulation as a first line treatment for patients presenting with the sphincter gap one uh, up to 180 degrees and a combination of internal and external sphincter defects as well. And again, there's a rewarding improvement of symptoms measured with the commonly used outcome criteria. So it appears to work in patients 
presenting with a sphincter defect without the sphincter defect being repaired up front. If you extrapolate our current knowledge of the indi indication for sacral nerve stimulation and look at a cohort of patients presenting with fecling, severe fecal incontinence to a tertial refer center, the St. Mark's Hospital in this specific case, you see this spectrum of potential causes re uh, resulting in fecal incontinence. And based on our experience with sacral nerve stimulation so far, in about 34% of those patients, sacral nerve stimulation would be an option to consider. And as it is not very invasive and has this test trial uh, option, it's a less invasive approach as compared to conventional means like sphincter repair. But the idea of functional stimulation of the peripheral nerve supply has been expanded further. It has been is now used in, the, in an intermittent way on the posterior tibial nerve, which by stimulating appears to modulate sacral, uh, sacral reflexes. Let's put it that way, it's a very simplistic view of what's happening. Uh, and this is a promising uh, tool for the future, I would think. It's an outpatient procedure. It can be done by nurses or instructed personnel. The protocol apply applies a dosage which decreases over time and patients come in, sit there for half an hour every week or every second week later during the course of the treatment and then go home. What can be achieved? Not too many studies are out, but the its results are very promising. It has been used in various forms of fecal incontinence, perfectly urged and mixed form of incontinence. And just a few example, examples of uh, the clinical benefit in around 80%, uh, 70%, the treatment uh, resulted in clinical improvement. This is fecal incontinence episodes, clear improvement. This is the Cleveland Clinic incontinence score, a clear improvement in most of the patients. The ability to postpone in minutes, some improvement in most of the patients. This results into improvement of quality of life, with even measured with the SF36, but more uh, prominent if the disease-specific Rockwood scale, the ASCA scale, is used, a clear improvement during the course of treatment. And even after the treatment has been discontinued after one year follow-up. So there seems to be a form of neuro neuromodulation effective neuroplasticity going on with this peripheral nerve, uh, nerve stimulation. These data are pretty preliminary, but they are reproducible, and thus uh, there will be a major focus on that in the years to come. How good is this peripheral form of tibial nerve stimulation as compared to sacral nerve stimulation? Is it a competitor, or is it an addition to what we have in the armatarium? It appears to be an addition. If you look at the, uh, the difference in score on the very uh, left side of the slide, there is a moderate improvement of scores with peripheral tibial nerve stimulation, but the improvement with sacral nerve stimulation is much higher. So the current understanding of these data is that tibial nerve stimulation may be a pathway to sacral nerve stimulation, if it's not working sufficiently good in clinical practice, if the improvement of symptoms is uh, insufficient for the individual, another form, a more invasive form, even though sacral nerve stimulation is not very invasive, can be considered. There's a clear trend to, towards less invasive techniques, which even can be applied in an outpatient setting, like, like the posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Uh, the injection of biking agents has uh, got recently some attention. It's not a new thing, but recently there are new substances around and new ideas how to best apply the substances. This is just an example of an, uh, of an transanal application of a substance which initially was used for the cosmesis industry and it was, has been recently published. The results have been recently published in, in The Lancet. This is an overview, so the technique is not as new. It's around since 1993, but various substances with uh, marginal success were reported. 
but there seems to be a change with this new substance coming in. This is one of the very few studies in our field which was randomized control double blinded shame, uh, shame uh, uh, design. As I mentioned earlier, it has been published recently. There has been a reasonable number of responders to the treatment, around 50%, which is acceptable given the fact that this is Min really minimal invasive, it's like a hemorrhoid injection, it's a 10 minute procedure. But the remarking finding is also that in 30% uh, of those patients being treated with shame substance, or not being treated actually, just an injection, responded to therapy, which addresses the issue that the treatment of fecal incontinence has to a lot to do with psycholo psychological aspects, it has to do with attention to the patient, with instruction how to uh, modify your lifestyle and so on. But nevertheless, this substance, Nasha Day X, is uh, changing fecal incontinence in a very positive way. The frequency of incontinence episodes decreased, with that the frequency of incontinence three days, and the ability to postpone defecation was improved, and this improvement had an impact on quality of life again. So there is something available which is minimal invasive, which augments the sphincter complex and can be done in an outpatient setting. It's worthwhile to consider this treatment as an initial treatment. It's somewhere in between conservative means and more advanced surgical means. A new kit on the block is the magnetic sphincter. It's not a sphincter substitute, it's a sphincter augmentation. These are magnetic beans which separate which separate if a certain force, outpushing force is applied, and the canal opens up, and by the magnetic force com uh, closes up again. Data are preliminary, but this, due to the fact that it is minimal invasive, easy to apply, will create some attention.